Welcome, everybody. I'm David Franco. I'm with ClearPoint Neuro. Uh, welcome to today's edition of ClearPoint TV's webinar series, Advantages of Laser Catheter Placement via Peel Away Sheath. Today, we're going to talk about a new product offering. Um, it's a new peel away, two new peel away sheath kits available that allow insertion of either a five French or a seven French device through the ClearPoint platform to a pre confirmed target in a single pass. Dr. Richardson uh, will we'll get more into what exactly that means and what the benefits are. Dr. Richardson is the Director of Functional Neurosurgery at Mass Massachusetts General Hospital, the Charles Pappas Associate Professor of Neuroscience at Harvard Medical School, and a visiting Associate Professor of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, of Cognitive Sciences at MIT. His clinical expertise encompasses DBS and gene therapy for movement disorders, as well as comprehensive epilepsy surgery, including stereo EEG, laser thermal ablation, and responsive neurostimulation. Prior to joining, prior to joining M MGH, Dr. Richardson was director of the Epilepsy and Movement Disorder Surgery Program at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center at UPMC. There he established one of the world's leading interoperative MRI functional neurosurgery programs, work which he now continues at MGH. He's a, he was ideally suited to be one of the first users of this new peel away sheath. He's been a ClearPoint user and advocate for many years and has performed well over 100 neurosurgeries using ClearPoint in the MRI. He identified the need for this ve very early on, so we're pleased to be able to bring this to him. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Richardson, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, start your screen share. While he's doing that, I want to note, um, we do want this to be interactive. So if you have any questions that come up, I'll ask that you, each of you are on mute, but you can go ahead and enter into the chat section any type of questions you might have. So I'll, let, I'll go ahead and uh, Dr. Richardson, you can take it from there. Great. Thank you, David. Um, thanks to the rest of the ClearPoint Neuro team also for the uh, invitation to present on this topic. Um, so this is a, a, a pretty simple um, topic and relatively simple advancement, but I think it's once very important for uh, doing laser ablation uh, in the hippocampus, and I was asked to include this slide. Okay, um, so let's jump right in there, but please, I'm going to try, David's going to monitor the question and answer uh, box uh, for me, but I'm also going to uh, try to look at that, so please just interrupt with any questions. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll present one case, um, and we'll just start by talking a little bit about, at least in my practice, the, the primary use cases uh, for lit and epilepsy surgery. Um, so this isn't um, necessarily a first approach where we would otherwise use temporal lobectomy, um, but these are, these are probably priority order for how I think about this. Um, so obviously language dominant uh, MTS uh, with concordant non-invasive data. So in these cases, uh, we often won't do stereo EEG uh, or a grid first. If all the data is concordant, there's left M MTS, it's a language dominant side, we might go straight to uh, mesial temporal laser ablation. Um, in MRI negative cases, uh, in our practice, we always do stereo EEG first uh, to prove that the onset is mesial. Um, oh, let me just also say for number one, if it's language non-dominant side, we might do the same thing. Uh, those cases, we, we may be more likely to just stick with temporal lobectomy. But MRI negative um, cases, uh, in our hands, we always uh, want to prove that the onset's mesial uh, with stereo EEG. Hypothalamic hamartoma is obviously uh, you know, an obvious one. Um, I've done a few of those uh, on the adult side. Uh, and extratemporal uh, foci, uh, when they're SEEG proven again uh, to be relatively focal in their onset, uh, we've had some uh, pretty good success, uh, even in non lesional frontal lobe uh, epilepsy uh, with lit. But the case I'll talk about today is uh, hippocampal ablation. So um, here are a couple uh, questions about. Uh, or related to you know, why we might have failures in these cases. Um, and uh, let me just say now to, to maybe keep your interest, the case that I'm gonna present today is actually a failure. I don't think it's, a, it's not a technical failure in the way the, uh, the ClearPoint worked for sure, which is helpful in trying to uh, understand why the patient's not seizure free. Um, so I'll take you through that case. But I think this is, this is one of the reasons that patients might fail, which is uh, just not ablating uh, enough of the mesial temporal lobe. And 
I think this is still an open question about whether single versus multiple trajectories is more appropriate. Um, to date, I've taken the approach of just doing one single trajectory in all of the cases. Uh, and I think some people um, have this question about whether or not a transventricular trajectory is okay, what the risk of that might be. Um, I've always taken this approach uh, of going through the ventricle because I felt it's the best, uh, best way to get down the long axis of the hippocampus and get as large an ablation as possible. Um, however, we did run into some um, issues with this uh, when, we, when we started doing these all the way up to the point uh, where this peel away sheath was uh, created. Uh, and that problem is the probe deflecting off of the hippocampus because it's not sharp enough uh, once it goes through the ventricle. So for those of you out there who are familiar uh, with using the ClearPoint device for DBS, you know that the ceramic probe is inserted through a peel away sheath. Um, that's a rigid stylet. Uh, and once that's confirmed to be at the correct target, you're there, you don't have to do anything else but pull the ceramic stylet out, put the DVS lead in, you know it's gonna to go to the same place. Um, the problem with laser ablation had been that uh, even after inserting um, uh, a probe, ceramic stylet, um, it is, uh, uh, it, it's still possible for the probe, the laser probe itself to deflect off the hippocampus. And um, we have, we primarily use, even though we have here at MGH the visual aid system at, at UPMC, we primarily use the, the Neuroblade system. Um, both of these, however, have a, you know, a, a floppy um, laser probe, which is the nature of the probe. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. This is an image from, from one of those patients um, uh, back in Pittsburgh. So here is the trajectory you can see you know, of the probe, and here's the hippocampus. And you can see what's happened, it's glanced off the side of it and it's just essentially floating in the ventricle. So I had this happen on more than one uh, patient um, and uh, it takes a lot of futzing around to try to figure out then how to get something um, sharp down the correct trajectory to uh, pierce the hippocampus. One thing that we didn't wanna do was to introduce air along the ablation track into the hippocampus um, because of the uh, um, uh, concern with throwing off the MR thermometry. Um, so we really didn't want to make a, a full pass uh, into the hippocampus first uh, before inserting the laser probe uh, because we, we want the MR thermometry readout to be as accurate as possible. Um, so this was the planned trajectory in that case. You can see how far off it is. Now in each of these cases, fortunately through realignment with the ClearPoint um, tower, we were able to, to redirect the probe into the hippocampus, but um, this add, added risk, you know, that wasn't necessary with multiple brain uh, penetrations, um, obviously adds time to the case. Uh, so there was a real desire to avoid this happening in the future. And the solution is very simple, which is just a peel away sheath uh, where a sharp stylet can be used to uh, pierce the hippocampus. Um, and then the ceramic side that can be removed and the laser probe can go right into the sheath, which can then be withdrawn a certain distance. Um, right, so this is pretty obvious here. This is the goal. The sheath prevents intraventricular deflection of the laser probe, significantly increase, increases safety and uh, potentially reduces OR time. And just it gives, it gives an added degree of confidence, which I think is very important. So um, I'll just show you this case. Um, this is a 67 year old lady, a couple years of medically intractable epilepsy. So that is a little odd uh, because it's late onset. So she went through a whole uh, process of being ruled out uh, for things like Alzheimer's disease um, and autoimmune um, um, contributions, but she's having a lot of seizures, one or two a day a classic uh, temporal lobe semiology. Um, this is, these are some video uh, screen grabs um, that show the, her automatisms and um, essentially kind of standard temporal lobe semiology. Her phase one data showed uh, scalp EEG with left posterior temporal onsets. Um, here's an example. 
uh, both in T5 uh, and O1. Um, there was a finding on her imaging, which was transient, which was a, a flare hyperintensity um, in the uh, perihippocampal gyrus and a little bit in the, in the hippocampus, otherwise MR negative. It was thought that that might have been related to uh, seizure uh, because it was transient. Um, it's a very subtle PET finding. Um, so here are examples of the imaging, hoping hopefully these are projecting well for you. And you can see this is some of this flare abnormality that um, subsequently went away. Um, very subtle kind of pet, pet findings in here of hypometabolism. Okay, we got a Meg. Uh, it wasn't helpful. There were no interictals. Um, her neuropsychology evaluation was, was um, consistent with left mesial temporal deficits, and she was left language dominant uh, based on her fMRI. So then we proceeded with stereo EEG. This is what our implantation uh, looked like for this case. Um, this would be kind of our standard uh, temporal lobe coverage uh, with electrodes going into the insula. Um, and because of the concern uh, for the involvement of posterior areas potentially in the onset, um, we had uh, kind of favored a more posterior implantation strategy here. Okay, so this was uncomplicated. We recorded a lot of seizures, um, 25. All of them essentially started in the hippocampus. Um, so that's shown here. Here's the electrode in the hippocampal um, tail. Um, so they did seem to start uh, more posteriorly, uh, but followed you know, very soon after um, uh, by onset, uh, more anterior in the hippocampus. Uh, and these were quite consistent. So um, for us, this matched very well with um, recommendation for left um, hippocampal lit. This is an older lady, um, language dominant side, uh, SEEG proven onsets in the hippocampus. Um, so potentially a great case for lit. Um, and of course, the, uh, the, the chance of having a successful outcome uh, is improved with uh, accurate targeting. So I'll just take you through the workflow. Um, we have the opportunity to, to pre-plan these. Um, so here's an example. I, I tend to target at the junction of the head of the hippocampus and amygdala. One thing you'll notice here is that this, this maybe in retrospect looks a little lateral. You know, here maybe we're coming through the body of the hippocampus. At the end, it's a little lateral, which um, uh, sometimes happens to, to try to get uh, the junction of the amygdala. Um, I have an, we have an MR, uh, an MRIS uh, set up at, at MGH. It's a 3T magnet. Uh, at UPMC, we had a diagnostic scanner is 1.5, but it was also a larger bore um, system. We use the clear point uh, fixation device. Uh, one thing to note, just a pointer on the MRIS setup, and those of you who have one have probably already know this, but we did figure out that we can start draping the bore before the start of the case. It saves some time. Positioning obviously is prone. Um, one note on the positioning, both in the diagnostic scanner um, and in the MRIS, you know, these larger bore scanners, I have never worried too much about um, uh, tucking the head uh, in extreme positions. I've always had it, uh, not ever had it be a, a major problem, at least I can remember, of, of having these patients. Now, they're not neutral, they're tucked some, but, um, uh, you know, we don't, we don't do this to an extreme uh, extent. Whoops. Uh, just one uh, one thing to note there, because I think um, you know some sometimes people feel like they really need to just maximally um, uh, tuck the chin to have a successful um, case, but that's that's not something that uh, I've fussed over too much. Um, so this is what the trajectory looked like in this case. Um, you know, again in retrospect, it looks looks maybe a little lateral. Um, so uh, most of you probably who are tuned in here know the workflow. Um, this is uh, after we've mounted the clear point and we can fine tune the targeting at this stage. So this is what this looked like uh, for this case. Uh, in alignment and drilling. So um, we're aligning it at this point. And then um, we can, uh, fortunately in the Emirates setup, bring the patient out and, and use the, the power drill um, to make our burr hole uh, directly through the uh, 
clear point uh, fluid stem, uh, guide stem. And here's our expected uh, error. Okay, so here's what the PLOA sheath looks like. Looks exactly like what you'd expect it to if you have used this for, for DBS. Um, so there's, uh, there's both a sharp and a blunt stylet included. Uh, this is the five French, which matches the, the laser probe diameter. Um, so we insert this uh, nearly to the target depth, um, but not all the way, just to not introduce air at the very tip. Because once the, uh, once the stylet is in the hippocampus, um, you know, the probe's going to go the rest of the way. The, the point that we're really trying to ensure that we get past is the uh, entry into the hippocampus from the ventricle. Um, so then we can uh, remove the ceramic stylet, insert the probe, we can make sure the sheath is pulled back um, far enough uh, to be out of the way of the, um, of the ablation zone, and then we can do the ablation. Okay, so this is what uh, this looks like in this case. It's very straightforward, um, you know, just like a DBS case, it's inserted easily. You pull out the ceramic stylet, put the laser probe in, um, and you're ready to go. Um, so this is what our placement looked like here. Um, here's some screenshots from the Visual A software. Uh, just show the ablation. Watch this for a second. Let's see how long this goes. Maybe we won't watch the whole thing. You get the idea. Um, here's a screenshot from uh, what this looked like when we finished. Here's a post contrast scan. So it shows the ablation is, you know, is, is pretty good. I think the angle we took, you know, allows us to get back uh, pretty far, uh, but you can see we missed, I think, some of the mesial, um, mesial parts of the head of the hippocampus uh, for sure. This may be parahippocampal gyrus down here, but I think, you know, concern about the, the mesial portion. You know, and sure enough, here's the, here's the outcome. You know, so here seizures returned at about three months, although they've, they've had reduced frequency. So um, we did not take out the, the seizure onset zone. Um, I just mentioned that we do these as a same day procedure. I give the patients a seven day steroid taper because I found that helps with the, with the headache um, that they otherwise will get, but we are doing these same day uh, and just letting patients go home. Okay, so here's a summary. Um, so I, the, I think this is absolutely critical, this, this sheath for, um, for increasing confidence and increasing uh, safety. And I really did, it, um, it made me nervous every time before we had this doing these cases with this uh, issue of potentially bouncing off the hippocampus and what it would take to, to redirect the probe um, to make sure it's in the right spot. So this is a simple fix for which, uh, you know, uh, I'm very appreciative. I'm sure others will be who, who use this um, in laser ablation cases. Um, and uh, obviously it's especially helpful for transventricular trajectories. Um, and I think importantly, in a case like this where there's a, there's a failure where the uh, therapy did not work uh, like we had hoped it would, it's very important to know that the case was executed in the way uh, it was planned. So um, we're not in a situation here where we're thinking, oh, well, maybe something went wrong because uh, you know, we were, the, the laser probe bounced off the hippocampus first and we had to readjust it. It didn't go exactly where we planned and maybe that has something to do with it. In this case, um, you know, there's, a, there's an issue with the surgical plan itself, uh, just with uh, the ability to ablate enough um, tissue uh, in general or there's a you know there's an issue with our workup for the patient, but certainly it's not a technical issue with with execution of the um, surgery um, in terms of uh, putting the probe to target and and uh, and doing the ablation in the, in the spot that that we planned, you know in this case. So that's it. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those. Um, David. Dr. Richardson, I, yeah, I'm not seeing any questions on the chat. I've got, um, I, I have a question and just uh, maybe this could prompt some thoughts. Um, now having this tool, I know that you had, you had requested it given the DBS experience, I think, and seeing the benefits it, it provided there and you were able to, now you can see using it in laser ablation. Are there, having this tool now though, does this sort of prompt thoughts about other types of cases you might pursue? 
that maybe you, you hadn't thought about uh, pursuing before? Um, that's a good question. Um, the short answer is nothing, you know, nothing uh, maybe comes to, comes to my, let me just think about that. Uh, that's not true. So we had, I would say, um, you know, it's similar issue. Um, I think, I think it's also helpful for cases like hypothalamic hamartomas or, or hamartomas in general, where you're pushing the, um, the laser cannula into tissue that may be more uh, firm. And so uh, if you can use the, the peel away sheath, uh, which again is gonna allow you just to make one pass into the brain with a sharp stylet um, or a rigid you know, stylet in the case of the blunt stylet, uh, then you leave the, the uh, sheath in place and you know you're in the right spot. So I'd say it's really, it's, it's uh, any, there is not a procedure where I will not use the sheath for laser ablation. Um, so I think it increases confidence, especially for transventricular, uh, but also for things like hamartomas. Yeah. David, I'm not hearing you. I don't know if that's... Uh... Sorry, I have a bad habit of not, not uh, pressing the, the mute here. I was just gonna mention um, that it, I, I think that is the intent in many ways is for physicians who are just getting used to ClearPoint this is an opportunity for them. It, uh, having that confidence of just a single pass, I think takes away a lot of that uncertainty and risk that gets into it. So I think that perfectly highlights. Now we do have some, uh, some questions. Uh, one from um, Brandon Hedgepath. We have Dr. Richardson, is there a product that's comparable to the ClearPoint platform? No, there's not. I saw that question. Um, no, there's not one that's even close in my mind. Um, I mean, I know the FHC system has a um, has an MRI compatible um, product, uh, but there is no other system where you can um, that has integrated software that allows you to make the trajectory, um, dial in uh, exactly where you want to go, correct for error, which is important. Um, so, for instance, the case I showed where the cannula is deflecting off the hippocampus. I know in, in one of those cases, we had to uh, make another entry point. You know, we had to, to make another uh, uh, burr hole in the skull, which required moving the, the base in order to make sure we could get into the hippocampus. Um, so this is still, I mean, after years, it's been, I think, 2010 since this was uh, FDA approved, 2000, yeah. Um, there's still not really anything uh, uh, close for, for these types of procedures, you know, where it can really fit uh, any type of device. Okay. I've got a question here just about for if there's any uh, follow-up questions, um, if the contact information, I guess the, what, I, what I'll suggest to the, to the group, if there's, um, if there's any follow-up questions, uh, just from the general audience, please reach out to ClearPoint Neuro. I think uh, directly we can and, and we can uh, arrange. I sent my email. I put it in the chat, David. I don't mind. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. You can, also can feel, feel free to email. Yourself. Thank you, but that's not a big deal. I can email. Me. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any uh, any other questions available. I. What, maybe we go ahead and wrap it up here. I want to thank thank you, Dr. Richardson, for coming and uh, for uh, for supporting it for supporting ClearPoint, but also trying out this new product and giving uh, such uh, great feedback. And thank you to the audience for taking the time today and uh, learning, uh, help, helping helping us uh, convey this knowledge along. And I think with uh, with that, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Hope everyone has a great day. Great, thank you.